Okay, looking at um, looking at these cross sections of the spinal cord, let's go ahead and talk about different parts that we need to be aware of. Um, there's a they're they're duplicated, so I'm just going to work on this top one. Okay, now when you look at the gray matter, there's a part of the gray matter up here and down here, both the same, right? That, that's actually touching the outside. Does anyone know, is that going to be dorsal or ventral? Dorsal. Yeah, that's your dorsal part, and then your ventral part's down here, okay? So this has a special name. This is called your dorsal gray horn. And then this is going to be your ventral gray horn. Okay, your, your dorsal gray horn is going to be um, housing second order somatosensory neurons that are involved in SCP and other things. So think somatic sensation for dorsal gray horn. Ventral gray horn, <coughs> that's the house of, of the um, alpha motor neurons or the lower motor neuron cell bodies that we just talked about. We'll talk a little bit more about those as time goes on. Okay, um, the other part that I'd like you to be aware of, there's, there's two different things to see here. There's a little invagination. Um, in the dorsal portion of the spinal cord here. Does anyone know what that is called? That's going to be, so if I'm pointing to this thing, here's your dorsal <coughs> median, median for middle sulcus. So there's a dorsal median sulcus here. It's going to be in the dorsal portion of the spinal cord. Okay, and then it's kind of a small, so it's called a sulcus. Okay, small little invagination here is a sulcus. And this one down here is going to be a little bit bigger. So this is going to be a fissure. So this is your dorsal median sulcus. This one's here is your anterior median fissure. That's a little bit larger. Yes? Is there a reason why we would term it anterior rather than ventral in this case? Um, you can use either terms. Um, okay. But I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to uh, show you that there are different regions of the spinal cord to be aware of, but I'm going to call one region dorsal and the other is an anterior, which okay. is why I'm choosing anterior at this point. Okay. You can say ventral if you want to. But it's anterior. Okay, anterior, ventral. And you can say dorsal or posterior. Either way, so this is posterior, this is ventral or anterior. Okay? Okay, everybody see? That's not a question. Okay, everybody see where we are? Okay, um, and I have two different two different views of the spinal cord here, so I'm going to choose to represent the, somatos the somatosensory tracks. So we're just going to draw on the tracks here. It's going to be the white matter. And the, the, this area down here is going to be for so somatosensory. And then this area up here is going to be motor tracks. I like to separate them when we first start because otherwise it gets really crowded and it, it just doesn't work as well. So realize that all the tracks that I'm going to draw are on, in all levels of the spinal cord for the most part, um, but I'm just separating them now so you can see them. Okay, just, just visual representation. All right, now, as I said before, when Sam asks a question, um, I'm going to say that the white matter that exists in this region here, in the dorsal part of the spinal cord, this white matter, okay, realize that it's duplicated. So here's one side, and then there's the other side, and it's just a complete duplicate, okay. This is going to be, this is known, this area of white matter are known as your dorsal columns. Okay. Dorsal columns are nothing more than the area of white matter in the dorsal portion of the spinal cord. And you're also going to have <coughs> other areas to consider. So if I divide it out <coughs> here, <coughs> In here, <coughs> I 
I label those. So <coughs> you have your dorsal columns and anything that resides in this area here, this is going to be your anterior columns or they're considered anterior columns. And again, everything that's down here is also up here. And then here on the side, nothing fancy, these are just considered your lateral columns. So when you're looking at the spinal cord in general, you can divide it into tracts that reside in the dorsal columns, tracts that reside in the lateral columns, or tracts that reside in the anterior columns. And they're usually named as such. Got it, Kim? Yeah? Make sense to everybody? That's where we're going. And we're going to start down here with the somatosensory tracks that we talked about before. And the first one is going to be, I'm going to do it in blue right here. Here. Okay, here's one track. So this is the track that's on this side. It could be the left side. And then Here's another track that's duplicated on the other side. This is the same track. This is a track that's, that's part of the dorsal column system. Think dorsal column medial lemniscus. That would be one of those. Okay? It's part of your dorsal column system. And um, it has kind of a funky name. It's called your fasciculus, F-A-S-C-I-C-U-L-U-S, gracilis, G-R-A-C-I-L-I-S, <clears throat> fasciculus gracilis. And if you remember way back when, um, fasciculus, nothing more than a collection of white matter, axons in the CNS, that's all it is, but it happens to reside in the dorsal column system. Fasciculus gracilis is going to be most medial. And then just on the outside of fasciculus gracilis is going to be another part of the dorsal column system that is in, called fasciculus cuneatus. Okay, fasciculus, nothing more in collection of white matter axons. Cuneatus is C-U-N-E-A-T-U-S. So, that's the dorsal column system composed of two separate tracts. Reciculus gracilis. Reciculus gracilis carries fine touch, per perception, vibration from T6 and below. Reciculus cuneatus carries DCML fine touch, vibration, per position from T6 and above. We'll get into that. That's a lot, a lot of detail, but essentially that's the dorsal column system. Okay, this is the, the first part of the DCML tract, dorsal column. Spencer. Um, I will, yes, so this, the fasciculus gracilis is responsible for carrying the DCML information of fine touch, per perception, vibration, from the level of T6 and below, the stipulus cuneatus is responsible for carrying DCML information from T6 and above. Final level. Final. Yeah. Other questions? Does that make sense? We'll get into a lot more detail with that. This is like, this is just getting us started. Did you have a question, Mary? Can you repeat it? <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. We don't get a whole lot more about this. I just said it. It's not that important right now, but I'll say it again. So, fasciculus gracilis carries DCML information, which is fine touch vibration per perception, from T6 and below. Fasciculus cuneatus carries DCML information, fine touch vibration per perception, from T6 and above. And that's your dorsal column system. And we'll get into a whole lot of detail about that. So this is just, I'm just drawing the tracks in right now. Okay, that's, those are your dorsal columns. That's all you need to know about for dorsal columns. Somatic sensation. Okay, now let's move a little bit over. Let's choose 
this color. Um, now this is the, the track that I talked about a little bit in the beginning. It's going to be more dorsal. It's in the lateral column system, but it's going to be kind of a little bit most dorsal here in the lateral column system. Okay. And they're just, they're just duplicated. And there was one, there was one thing that I talked about earlier um, that had both dorsal and ventral, and those were the spinocerebellar tracks. Okay. So this one's more dorsal. So this is going to be your dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Okay? There's one on both sides. It's just duplicated information. So part of the lateral column system is going to be your dorsal spinocerebellar tract. And <coughs> if you have your dorsal spinocerebellar tract, just underneath that, you're going to have your ventral spinocerebellar tract. So it's going to be here. And these are just all the things that we talked about at the start of the talk um, that you'd expect to see in a cross section of the spinal cord. This is your ventral spino cerebellar tract. Okay. So, ECMLA system, some dorsal columns, ventral and dorsal spinal cerebellar tracts, part of the lateral column system. <clears throat> and then there's going to be one that kind of crosses over. <clears throat> and the one that crosses over um, is actually, sometimes you'll actually hear it as anterolateral. Okay. So this is going to be an anterolateral tract, and what that means is it goes from the anterior column and crosses over into the lateral column system. So you may hear anterolateral spinal thalamic tract. That's the last one that we talked about. So that's going to be your here, spinothalamic tract. <clears throat> so that's it. Those are all your somatosensory tracts. You have your dorsal column system, fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. In the lateral system, you have your dorsal and ventral spinal cerebellar tracts. And then in the anterolateral area, crossing over, you have your spinothalamic tract. Questions about that? Is that pretty straightforward? Yes, yeah, Sam. Sorry, can you said this at the beginning. I just want to double check. So, so this is an anterior view, and so those like the bean-shaped tracks, there's going to be like kind of like running vertically. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So a lot of times when I explain tracks to a patient in the clinic, I'm going to say they're just like train tracks. So if you can imagine a train track going from your brain all the way down to your spinal cord, it's just one one long track. That's it. It's spelled different, but. Anybody else? Yeah, these are just long tracks. These are nothing more than, these tracks are bunches of myelinated axons. And that's it. They're common origin, common destination. That's how they're named. Okay, that's somatosensory system. And realize that, you know, these are all be going up here, but I'm only going to choose to do the motor up here, that they're really in both, just to make it simple. So when I look at the motor, um, big tracks that we need to know about, the big one hmm, is going to be present, and I'll even draw that. So here's the dorsal column. There's nothing in the dorsal columns. Um, there's your lateral columns, and then there's your anterior columns, right? So it helps you think about it. So here is the big one is your corticospinal tract here. However, since it resides in the lateral column system, it is called your lateral corticospinal tract. The 
symphysis. There's actually two corticospinals, so we'll talk about that. But this is your lateral corticospinal tract. Okay, and then just underneath your lateral corticospinal tract in the same lateral column system, you're going to have this red one, this maroon thing. Let's keep that color maroon. And that'd be your rubrospinal tract. Spinal tract, you have your rubrospinal tract. Mm -hmm. And like I said, um, the, the corticospinal tract itself is, is really composed of, of uh, two different tracts in the spinal cord. You have your lateral corticospinal tract here as part of the lateral system. You also have your anterior corticospinal tract, which resides in the anterior column system. Okay, so here's your anterior corticospinal tract. Label that one. And we'll talk more about the difference between the anterior and the lateral corticospinal tract when we get to the motor section of the spinal cord. But just for now, you know that these tracts exist and where they reside in the spinal cord. <clears throat> Trying to go back to um, the regular colors. Now thinking about, let's do the orange. Did I do orange already? Let's make this purple. What the heck? Um, there's one down here. It's in the anterior system, and it's on the bottom. <coughs> or it's going to be most most anterior, most ventral. This here, and and I like to say it's most ventral, so that I remember it begins with a V. And the tract that we talked about that began with a V is going to be your vestibulospinal tract. <coughs> this guy right here. So it's most ventral. V for ventral, V for vestibulospinal tract. that's left is your reticulospinal tract. Reticulospinal is right on top of vestibular spinal, vestibulospinal. So here's your reticulospinal tract. Reticulospinal tract. Reticulospinal tract is most ventral, most anterior, and on top of that is your reticulospinal tract. So those are all the motor tracts that we talked about. The big one that carries the majority of, of uh, motor information that we need to know about is going to be your lateral corticospinal tract. That's the big one. Questions? Let's see how that works out. I realize the way that I've drawn it, I've just tried to keep it really simple by separating the somatosensory and motor information on two different cross sections. But realize that these dorsal columns, they'd be filled in here too. I just, this is the way that I said it. So essentially as you're traveling up, you have um, this information just traveling all the way up the spinal cord in these tracks that are contiguous all the way throughout the level of the spinal cord. Questions?
That makes sense. Yeah, see that? Okay. You'll see that again, for sure. Uh, let's move on. Enough of the hard stuff. Lots of new words. That's all hard stuff. Let's move into something that's a little bit easier. Let's talk about roots, nerves, and rami. Okay. <clears throat> so this is just a transverse section through the spinal cord here again. Here's your gray matter, and this area is going to be, since the gray matter is touching up here, that's going to be dorsal. And then this is going to be ventral. Okay. Um, these are <coughs> hooks up project projections of, of um, roots, nerves, and rami. And this is my rendition of a muscle, <laughs> muscle belly. So this is going to be here representative of back muscles. So essentially, um, paraspinals, okay, think back, back, back muscles. And then this is representative of extremity and other trunk muscles. Right? So, um, you know, think abs, essentially. Right? So arms, legs, and abs. So the front of your body with the extremities are going to be down here. And then your back musculature is up there. So we got that? Okay. In addition to the, um, <clears throat> in addition to the musculature, we're also going to have um, some sensory information that comes specifically from either uh, goes to the, the back or, or comes from the back or the extremity and other muscles. So this is going to be somatosensation. sensation. <coughs> of the back. Okay? And then um, in the same way, this is going to be somatosensation sensation of extremity and other trunk muscles. Okay. So if I got it, see where we are. Alright. Go ahead and so we, we talked about this earlier. This is gonna be your dorsal gray horn. <clears throat> and then this is gonna be your ventral gray horn. So the ventral gray horn is okay. And we also talked before <coughs> about this structure right here being the home to gray matter in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, this is going to be your dorsal root ganglia. So dorsal root ganglia. <clears throat> and what kind of neural cell body exists in the dorsal root ganglia? Pseudounipolar. All right. So I've got my little, here's my neuronal cell body here. And I have my little stalk. Hmm. And coming off that, I'm going to have axons, that synapse, with another neural cell body in the dorsal root ganglia. And then, so this here is going to be your dorsal root, and here's the ganglia. So this whole thing 
Get your dorsal root. <clears throat> About the motor system, you have your lower motor neuron, which is also in the cell body, um, here in the ventral gray horn, and your lower motor neuron is in the cell body. This is known as an alpha A L P H A motor neuron, and that's nothing. That's nothing more than the normal cell body of your lower motor neuron. Exists in the outside the ventral gate horn. And thinking about the motor information, um, what happens is this alpha motor neuron sends out an axon through this structure called the ventral root. <coughs> <coughs> Let's label that. So this is the dorsal root up here. This guy down here is your ventral root. Okay, so note that in the dorsal, the dorsal root ganglion, the neural cell body, the axons coming out here in the roots themselves, in the dorsal root, you have somatosensory information. In the ventral root, you have motor information. Pretty simple. So dorsal somatosensory ventrals motor. And then um, when the two come to this part here, this is actually the nerve. <clears throat> two come together, what's known as the spinal nerve. Spinal nerve carries both somatosensory and motor information. And then we're going to branch off. <clears throat> Thinking about motor information, if this alpha motor neuron is sending motor information to the back, to the back, back of your body, your paraspinals, it's going to come this way. Okay. If it's sending out information to your extremity and trunk muscles, it's going to come this way. And these branch points are called rami. So this is going to be your dorsal ramus. R-A-M-U-S is the plural of the singular. And then this one's going to be your ventral ramus. So something traveling through the dorsal ramus is just innervating the back some way, whether it's muscular or somatosensory. So I have branching off the spinal nerve, going through the dorsal ramus, coming here, receiving, here's the dendrite, receiving information from the back, somatosensation, or I could have the dendrite coming through here, through the ventral ramus, receiving information from extremity and other trunk muscles. Okay. So overall, dorsal and ventral roots either carry somatosensory or motor information, respectively. They come together to form the spinal nerve. And you're hear about spinal nerve roots. That indicates a level of the spinal cord. You'll get there in CPD3. And then you get the level of the rami. And that branches off dorsal ramus, goes to back, posterior part of your body. And then the ventral ramus goes trunk and extremities. Questions? Hopefully that was super simple. No new words. Everything's pretty straightforward, right? All right, great. Let's move on. Another thing you're going to learn how to do in um, CP3 is going to be a reflex. That's the basic reflex. And that's in this picture. This is called a myotatic reflex. Does anybody know another name for myotatic reflex? Your basic? What, what, what's, what's a basic reflex? Right, uh, so to elicit the myotatic reflex, you use a reflex hammer. 
So you're going to put stretch on that muscle. So that's also known as the stretch reflex. So your myotatic reflex is also known as your stretch reflex. Okay? So essentially you put in a quick stretch. Quick stretch on that tendon. So you're stretching the muscle real quick. Okay, so to do that, you're looking at something called the myotatic reflex. And, and how that works is, is just shown here. Now again, this is just my standard cross section through the spinal cord, this transverse cross section, with this being dorsal and this being ventral, and I can even name the part here. This is going to be my dorsal root ganglia. <clears throat> Hopefully, by now everybody knows dorsal root ganglia houses first order somatosensory neurons, right? That's where the neural cell body is. Um, this is my rendition over here of a leg, where this would be the quads here, and then this would be the hamstrings here in the back, and then here's a femur, <clears throat> you know, and there's going to be a tendon here, okay? And this is just lower leg, and okay, that's what you're looking at. Okay, so if you took a reflex hammer and hit the patella tendon right here, what would you expect to happen? Yeah, you get quad extension, right? So you get a kick out. And what you're looking at is, is this is a simple reflex arc. This is pretty much an automatic reaction. It's a reflex. It does not involve the, the cortical region whatsoever, right? You take that reflex hammer. Can you see? Do you have a question, Jenna or Kelsey? Or something you can't see? Okay. Um, yeah, so that you take a reflex hammer, you hit the tendon. It's just a reflex arc that acts at the level of the spinal cord. It doesn't have to travel all the way up to the cortical region. Okay, and this just shows how it works. Um, in general, you have your, your basic muscle fibers have a, a special name. They're called extrafusal. Extrafusal, F U S A L, fibers. And that's just your basic muscle fiber. Okay, so your extrafusic fibers, or your basic muscle fibers, and that's what I've shown here in, in brown. <coughs> And in addition to your extrafusal fibers, you also have something called intrafusal fibers. And I'll just represent those here as orange. Orange in color. Okay. So your intrafusal fibers. Do I know what those are? You heard of? Ever heard of a muscle spindle? Yeah, muscle spindle is what your muscles are going to use to detect the stretch reflex. So your intrafusal fibers are nothing more than your muscle spindle. Spindles. Okay. And I've just, you know, they're they're intercalated in in all muscle tissue. Okay. Nothing more that they're they're special receptors that pick up stretch. That's your muscle spindle. So, here I can draw my first order neuron in my dorsal root ganglia. It has my little stalk, pseudo unipolar neuron. And the dendrites here are going to be responsible for receiving information from these muscle spindles. <clears throat> so, th this, this kind of neuron has a special name is called a type 1a fiber type 1a fiber okay type 1a fibers are specific for receiving information from the muscle spindles and detecting muscle stretch okay they have neural cell bodies that live in the dorsal root ganglia connect yeah. right to the muscle spindle so like I said, if you took a hammer and you hit here, you're going to quick stretch that muscle, which is going to send a signal to the type 1A fiber um, all the way to the neural cell body and the dorsal root ganglia. What happens here 
is that the axon that comes out actually bifurcates. So here and here. Yes. Yeah. Is that blue connecting to the intrafusal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Blue set up with the intrafusal. Type 1A fibers are for specific for muscle spindles. And uh, muscle spindles, are they arm intrafusal fibers? Any other questions? Can I see where they are? Okay. <clears throat> so we, we bifurcate there. Um, now, I'm going to draw this here. As I said, in the ventral gray horn here, we have alpha motor neurons, neuronal cell bodies with lower motor neurons. Um, and let's going to say that this one is specific here for the quads. I'm just going to put a quad alpha motor neuron. And then there's going to be another alpha motor neuron that I'm going to put over here. And that one's going to be specific for the hamstrings. So this is going to be a, bless you, hamstring. Alpha motor neuron. Okay. So what happens <clears throat> is the information coming in here through the type 1A fiber is going to bifurcate one branch is going to go to the quads and you told me that if I hit a reflex hammer here that's going to be stimulatory so I'm going to activate this is going to send activation information to the quads and I'm going to get quadriceps contraction but if my quads are firing what muscles do I want to relax Hamstrings, yes. So I want my hamstrings to relax. And what happens, people are asking about what, what the role of this thing was before. I don't see my little black mark. My, oh, there it is. Um, there's something called an interneuron here in the spinal cord. So that it's gonna, this, other, is, this other bifurcation is going to synapse with a cell body of an interneuron. And specifically, this interneuron is going to be inhibitory. So you stimulate an inhibitory interneuron, which is going to turn off the hamstring alpha motor neuron. Here. Questions about that. What happens is when you do a quick stretch, you're going to stimulate the contraction of the agonist, which is your quadriceps, and you inhibit contraction of the antagonist, which is your hamstrings in this case. Okay? This process of activating the quads and inhibiting the hamstrings is called reciprocal inhibition. Recip Reciprocal inhibition. Okay. And that's your basic reflex arc. You can see there's no there's no thought involved. If somebody hits you with, with a hammer in the right spot, you're just gonna kick out. Some people kick more than others, depends on how you're wired. But this is just a basic reflex arch. This is arc. This is the simplest reflex. It's called your myotatic or basic stretch reflex. Okay, you'll learn how to do that in CP3. Questions about that? We all good with that one? Let's go ahead and look at the. So this is myotatic, and then in addition to the myotatic, we also have the inverse myotatic. So. Same setup. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, so, type 
So intrafusal fibers, which are the muscle spindles, are present in all muscles. They're just intercalated in with the, the normal muscle tissue. Okay, so your quads are gonna have it and your hamstrings are going to have it. Okay. I don't know, I've not seen, and actually, yeah, in, in Murray, have, we'll learn how to do a, a quick stretch for a reflex for hamstrings. And you won't do it CP3, but we'll do it Murray. Okay? So yeah, every, everybody should have a reflex. I think you're only going to do it CP3 for quads because that goes with L3, L4 spinal level, you know, different thought process. Does that make sense? Okay. The biceps have, I mean, all, all of your muscles are going to have that intrafusal fibers, um, which are nothing more than the muscle spindles. All right. Inverse myopathic reflex. Next picture. Um, for this one, um, when I first put it, this is the same picture, except here I have a, a, an ankle weight. This is my representation of an ankle weight. And I have 50 pounds. Uh, that's not near enough. So let's go ahead and make that 450 pounds. Okay. So what you're seeing here is this, this guy or this person is trying to lift a 450-pound ankle weight. Oh, you know, having said that, so um, what's the purpose of the stretch reflex anyway? Keep her hurt yourself. No, in what way? How could you hurt yourself if you're stretching? If you overstretch your muscles. If you overstretch your muscles, correct. So you prevent your muscle from ripping. Okay, you're gonna prevent your muscle from ripping due to overstretch. Correct. How you don't want to hurt yourself, so you have the system set up. That's the basics of the stretch reflex. Okay? Now, the inverse myotatic reflex is another reflex set up so that you don't hurt yourself in simple terms, right? So if you try and lift a 450 pound weight with one leg. All right, maybe there's some people in this classroom that could do it. I don't know, but, you know, just saying anything. <laughs> you laugh. Um, but that, that, that's another reflex, okay? And that happens through um, a special kind of organ. Does anybody know what organ the, the inverse yeah, myotype? Yeah, that's your GTO. Your GTO is your Golgi tendon organ. Okay, your Golgi tendon organ, and where the muscle spindle detects muscle stretch, your GTO is going to detect muscle tension. Okay, so its job is to detect muscle tension. So in other words, if you try to lift something that's way too heavy, you could tear your muscle but that's because of increased tension, and that is received through the GTO, Golgi tendon organ. Okay, so for the inverse, inverse myotatic, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> your um, GTO is gonna be present here in the tendon, okay? Okay, so you have, associated with the tendon, you have your GTO, and you have here in the dorsal root ganglia, here's your first order somatosensory neuron that is linked up, receiving information from your GTO. And for the inverse myotatic reflex, um, this is going to be a type 1B fiber. Type 1 B fiber <coughs> comes in through the dorsal root and again bifurcates. And we still have we still have the alpha motor neuron here for the quads, and we have the alpha motor neuron here for the hamstrings. alpha motor neurons are going to come back and innervate their respective muscles or send out axons that innervate their respective muscles. Only this time, um, we want the opposite situation to happen, right? So 
if this is too heavy, we want this process to inhibit the quads, but activate the hamstring. does it is very similar. They're hooking up to the, the right kind of, of interneurons here. So in this case, they're going to synapse with a stimulatory interneuron for the hamstrings. And we're going to synapse with an inhibitory interneuron for the quads. <coughs> Questions? Yes? So, is this so you don't like over tax the quads? Mm -hmm. You don't want to put too much tension, too much muscle tension. If I tried to lift 450 pounds, I could rip something. This prevents me from doing that. It's going to shut my muscles down. It's something we're going to learn to use in our rehab um, to help with patients that have increased muscle tone. Okay, um, this process has a name too, like the other one was reciprocal inhibition. Um, this, this one's called autogenic inhibition. Right, this just prevents ripping the muscle due to increased muscle tension. And then uh, this is the flexion. This is called the the last one is the, the flexion withdrawal reflex. Okay, same picture. Essentially, here's my cross section, transverse section through the through the spinal cord. Um, this is hamstrings, this is quads, um, and this is a tack, right? This is, this is a tack. So imagine you're just walking by and you stepped on a tack. Um, that's why it's called the flexion withdrawal reflex. So you step on a tack, you don't want to step down harder, right? You just pull up, go into flexion. And that's what's going to happen. So the flexion withdrawal reflex. And um, the tack is detected by something special called a nociceptor. Okay. Hmm? You've heard that word? Good. Um, it's detected by a nociceptor. So let's go ahead and put that here. So so nociceptor means it's just a special receptor for detecting pain. to have happen. Yeah, it's a very similar system, so we can put these in here. Um, we can just go ahead and label this is going to be my quad alpha motor neuron. Here's my hamstring alpha motor neuron. While I'm here, I'm going to put them in the other side too. So that's my quad alpha motor neuron. There's my hamstring alpha motor neuron. Oh, 
Okay. Similar situation in axon from this first order neuron comes in through the dorsal root, through the dorsal gray horn, and it bifurcates. We're going to think about just stepping on the tack to start with. Okay. And these alpha motor neurons have axons that are innervating their respective muscles. You want your quads to activate or your hamstrings to activate? Well, uh, rectus femoris or quads. Rectus Do you want your quads? So if I if I step on a tack, just think about the right leg. If I step on a tack with my right leg and I do that, which muscles are activated? Is it my quads or my hamstrings? Hamstrings. Okay. I want it to go into flexion. Okay. A uh, hip flexors. How about hip flexors? So that's, that's, that's okay. Right. Hip flexors. Morris, right. Morris, that yeah. Morris. So that's going to be that's thinking about knee extension. Okay. I'm thinking about knee here. So hamstrings or knee flexors, right? Hamstr you want so hip flexors, knee flexors. They're all going to activate, right? So that means that the inner neuron here, hooked up to the hamstrings, or if you want to say hip flexors, is going to be stimulatory. Right, because I want those guys to fire, but my quads on that side, if I have a lot of knee, hip and knee flexion going on on the right side, I want my quads to relax. So that means this is going to be an inhibitory interneuron. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So, you have, so flexion withdrawal, your flexors are going to activate. Promote that withdrawal. Okay, now. On the opposite side, if on my right leg I've stepped on a tack and I pull my leg up like that, which muscles do I want to activate on the opposite side? Extensors, correct. So actually the, this information, this nociceptor actually crosses over to the other side okay, and bifurcates over here also. But the opposite happens so that you have an interneuron that's hooked up to the quads or that's innervating the quads that is stimulatory and the interneuron that's hooked up to the hamstrings is going to be inhibitory. You just need it to make sense, right? You think about it. If one side's coming up in the air, I want that other side to extend. So it's called the flexion withdraw reflex, okay? But on the opposite side, what you get is something known as, I'll just put plus, crossed extension. And again, all these, all these are just reflexes. They're happening at the level of the spinal cord. There's no cortical involvement whatsoever. It's to prevent you from getting hurt. Okay, step on the pack, you can step on the glass. A rusty nail, lots of different things. Bad things can happen, right? And that's what that's for. That's detecting it through the nociceptor. Questions? Okay. Yes, Jeff. So, say you have that same thing, but like it's a your upper body. Like, do you still need that like same sort of like balancing act? Like, say you like were reaching like towards the stove, you forgot it was still like on. They like, reach your hand back, you still need that like cross extension for the I, other side. Yeah, so um, I, was thinking, I always like to think about evolution and how things evolved. I mean, eventually, in the very beginning, the, our systems evolved as animals on all fours. I don't know if that exists in the upper extremities as well. It's a good question, but it, it might. But then again, if you have walking on all fours, you've got the, your lower extremity supporting you as well. So I don't, I don't know if it's only upper extremity or both. It's a good question. I'll look it up, though. I'll find out. Anybody else? Okay, how are we on content? Are you guys doing okay with all this stuff? We're doing okay. Yes? Yes? No? I mean, I asked you a question. I didn't understand the words you used to answer. I just got to study more, I think. <laughs> did I say something? What, what did you ask me that I didn't? All right, we're done. Thank you. What did you ask me that you didn't understand the words? <laughs> yes, sister. I have no idea.
did you ask me that I, I said something um, that you I didn't asked, understand? So with the um, with the room of final tracks. Oh, you were talking about. Somebody, kind of like, is that like the crossover, like the wind? No, no, that's what I was trying to say. No, no crossover. Completely different. Completely different than the spinal tracks. Completely different. It is, it is, it is uh, controlled. Upper, so, in other words, with that path where we're always on, we can walk around. All right, so folks have had strokes. They don't, they don't walk around, so that's in reflection tone. That's different than, um, you were, I, I thought you were talking about like C7 or something, but C5, C6 is your bicep, C7 is your um, extensors. But, you know, the, uh, the root of spinal tract is being dampened by the cortical spinal tract. By cortical involvement, by thought, because you can think. So it's only people who don't have that cortical involvement that they end up like this. Is that better for words or no? Better words. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I said any. I said dampen. I think dampen no, I think by cortical spinal. I just don't think. I just think it went over my head conceptually, which okay. is like your problem. Okay.